This is Urban Agriculture, episode number 21, Kiss and Tell. From Microbe TV, this is Urban Agriculture, episode number 21, recorded on February 23rd, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. You know when the last time we recorded? I don't want to look back. You don't want to know? I want to look forward, not back, but I know it's a long time That's actually the smartest thing you've ever said. (laughs) I don't want to look back. (laughs) That's a quote from Satchel Paige. What did he say? You should exactly? never look back because someone else might be catching up to you. <laughs> Don't look back because someone might be. Ca- yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome back, Dixon, <laughs> to uh, Urban Agriculture. Right. I just want to let everyone know the reason we don't publish more is entirely Dixon's fault. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I take full responsibility. <laughs> because you are the vertical farmer, right? <laughs> Apparently. There are others, though. There well, are let's others. Let's get them in. We've been trying. Well, today we're very we lucky. We, we're lucky to have a guest today who uh, will push us Help us push out the 21st episode. Exactly. Get over that big hump. He is a partner at an architectural firm here in New York City called Kiss and Cathcart Architects, Gregory Kiss. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Come all the way from Brooklyn. It's a long trip, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have many students who commute from Brooklyn. Yeah. In fact, I have an undergrad who's working in the lab. She lives in the Russian part of Brooklyn. Oh, yeah, out be. near uh, Brighton Beach. Uh, not, not Brighton Beach, another place. And she says it takes two hours for her to get here. I have a, uh, we have this, this fabulous transit system. I was able to get on the A and not have to change trains. And yet it took almost an hour. I grew up in Princeton and with, on a good day, I could have got here in the same amount of time. So. Yeah, that's right. You would have taken the jitney, right? Is that what they call it? Well, driving, the old, the old school <laughs> way, I suppose, on a good day. But. There used I know, to be a commuter train from Princeton. Because well, they, they, the New Jersey Transit goes to Princeton, but then yeah, right. it stops at Princeton Junction, and then in, ah. to get into Princeton, you have to take that little train. The Dinky. The Dinky. Yeah. They call it a Jitney. It's not a Jitney. That's uh, uh, that's uh, Atlantic City, that. <laughs> it's a great trip. So you were born and raised in Princeton? Born in Toronto, actually. You're so Canadian. Like Ted Cruz, <laughs> I'm, my qualifications are dubious, I guess, to be president. <laughs> Um, but I, I but you'd make a great president, I must say. Compared to Ted Cruz, I would vote for you <laughs> every day of the week. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I might almost agree with you on that. Um, we moved uh, from Toronto quite early, uh, actually, to England for a year, and then uh, ended up in Princeton, New Jersey. So I grew up hmm. mainly in that part of the world. Ask oh. him what his father did, or still does. You can perhaps. ask questions too. I, can, well, I thought that perhaps we would share these together. So, uh, <laughs> Greg, why were you um, so mobile? Well, I'm glad you asked, Dixon. <laughs> My father uh, is a physicist and entrepreneur. Uh, actually, with one of these amazing kind of new world American success stories. He had shown up in Toronto as a refugee not too many years Mm. before I was born, not speaking any English, uh, worked in farms and, uh, you know... Where was he from? Elsewhere. Hungary. Uh, Small mm. village. Basically grew up in a medieval world in a small village in Hungary. Um, Escaped by crawling through minefields and such in the the mid-50s. Was a refugee in Canada, um, ended up learning English, going to the University of Toronto, got a doctorate in engineering physics, went to do married my mother, who was actually from not so far away in Europe from where he was from, but she was really German ethnically. (laughs) And uh, we then went to, when I was about two, went to Oxford for a post graduate year or so and I have a very dim memory of attending the squirrel nursery school in Oxford (laughs) and uh, then to Princeton where my father got his first job working for uh, RCA David Sarnoff Research Center doing all kinds of cool stuff neat yeah so you grew up hearing about all this right yes Physics right. and electricity and electronics. That's neat. The Sarnoff Center is famous. Do you know that, Dixon? I do. Yes, I do. I'm from New Jersey, remember? Oh, we saw... <laughs> I saw amazing things there. I remember as a little kid going in at uh, Christmas time, and they had a big Christmas tree in the lobby that was decorated with 
rubies this, and emeralds the size of your fist. You know, they had <laughs> synthetic uh, uh, laser crystals things. they yeah, were sure. growing for various yeah. purposes. And I remember seeing lasers. My father worked on lasers. He worked on optical electronic technologies. Um, yeah. And I remember seeing a, a hologram in something like 1965, you know, and stuff mm. like that. So it was a, a, a magical environment. That's great. So... You grew up in Princeton. Did you go to high school there as well? Yeah, Princeton High School. Wow. Yeah, and then college was where? I uh, went to Yale. Mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, having kids now who are just out of college themselves, I, wow. I'm sure I never would have gotten in because to, you know, today <laughs> with the craziness that has come yeah, across feel this way, the educational you know? system, but uh, I was I was lucky to go there. I, You know, Princeton is a beautiful town, but I yeah. wanted to leave home Still. and... Still, Still a beautiful lovely. town. Yeah. So yeah, I went. Uh, I went to Yale, and then uh, not really knowing what I wanted to do with myself, I majored mm-hmm. in, in history, mm-hmm. but became interested in architecture toward the end of my undergraduate time there, and uh, concluded that uh, as my next step. Since I, there's a few in between stories, but I uh, decided, all right, I'll do architecture because that's going to be fun and easy. <laughs> so I went to Columbia Architecture School, and it turned out very quickly that I was wrong about part of it. It is mostly fun, but it's not easy, and I still haven't figured it out some, <laughs> I don't know, 35 years later. And I think that's one of the things that keeps me motivated. Hmm. So Columbia Architecture School is a very good school, right? It is, yeah. And um, when you... Go to architecture school. What, do you get a master's in uh, architecture? Yeah, I got a... So, the col- so f- here, that's all you can do at Columbia. You can't get a bachelor's in architecture, right? Uh, no. I think it's just a graduate program. Right. And do you... Is it like um, uh, being a doctor? You specialize in some kind of architecture? Or do you get a broad education? Well, it depends very much on the school. And uh, Columbia itself has changed enormously uh, mm. over the years. And... Frankly, one of the things that doesn't appeal to me about architecture is the kind of um, fashion um, focus that it sometimes has. There are certain intellectual or stylistic fashions that come and go and so on. When I was there, it was actually a very chaotic period. It was, uh, this really dates me, but postmodernism was one of the sort of current Mm -hmm. uh, styles of the time. And, you know, deconstructivism was just around the corner and so on. Um, And... There are people who embrace that kind of mm-hmm. attitude, and there's actually nothing wrong with it at all. It's, it's most real architects sort of travel that route, become very passionate about a certain style or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my case, I never felt that I worked that way. And in fact, I'd sort of almost forgotten about this because it's so long ago, but I had proposed uh, as a sort of independent thesis project doing a st- to do an architectural investigation of a zero energy house or building. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And that was, the proposal was rejected uh, because the <laughs> faculty just didn't quite see that, well, okay, that's kind of a technical engineering exercise, but it's mm-hmm. not architecture. So I ended up doing a normal studio course and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, how, how times have changed, mm. I think. You know, well, there's been so many architectural fashions that have come and gone in the meantime. And now uh, there is certainly, in many schools, a lot of really serious uh, investigation about issues of sustainability, mm, building sure. performance, resilience, yeah. and so on and so forth. That, I don't know, maybe I was ahead of my time, behind my time, both. Who knows? How long, how long was that uh, master's? Is that a two-year or four-year program? Three-year. Three-year program. So when you graduate from these, what do you do? You uh, just get jobs and work or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that depends on the times also. Um, in my case, I was naive and lucky mm-hmm. enough to just start my own business. And mm. I was taking advantage of my father, who uh, I can sort of fits nice, I can pick back up his story. Mm-hmm. So uh, he left RCA in the uh, early 70s to become an entrepreneur because he's always had a very strong drive that mm-hmm. way. And there was a lot of that sort of thing going on, as there still is. And so 
uh, he started a series of companies focused on different sort of optical electronic technologies, which included uh, things like making the world's first liquid crystal display Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) at a time when nobody knew what to do with liquid crystal displays. So they developed digital watches as something to put them in. And for a (laughs) brief period of time, he had the world's largest digital watch company uh, before that whole industry went to the Far East. And, you know, this has happened many times. And so uh, there, with a lot of intervening other products, technologies, and companies, um, around the time that or not long before I graduated from uh, architecture school, he had a company called uh, Cronar, which was into the photovoltaics business. And he had decided after all these digital display technologies and so on that solar energy, photovoltaics, was really a very significant uh, technology because it the energy industry is the biggest in the world and mm-hmm. it's something that affects our lives and our quality of lives more than almost anything else and so it's the big the big picture so he was actually um, producing the world's first commercial thin film photovoltaic panels they were just developing that technology at the time and so basically my Mm -hmm. my attitude or my uh, departure from architecture school I, I said you know well well, Dad, how about I design your factory for you? They were just ready to yeah. um, build their first one in Port Jervis, New York. So I partnered up with Colin Cathcart, who had been a classmate of mine uh, at uh, Columbia. And pretty much with that project and some other smaller ones, we started our own firm. I had no real-world experience mm. in business or architecture and was foolish enough to try it. And somehow... Um, I'm still in business. <laughs> Not sure so, how. But when you come out of architecture school, you could design a table, a, a house, or a or a factory. Is that right? You learned you know how to do everything. Well, the the thing about architecture school, and again, this depends a lot on the school. There are schools that are very focused on practical, real world type of experience mm-hmm. and knowledge, and there are many that aren't. And Columbia was not all the way to that end of the spectrum, but pretty far. And there is. I think a lot of good reasons for that. I mean, there are certain types of investigations and thinking and designing and so on that you will almost certainly never have a chance to do again Mm. after you leave school. So there are, there are many schools who provide pretty much that history, theory, design, but you know, studio design sort of in an aesthetic and sort of vaguely functional sense. And so that was pretty much my Columbia experience and I'd never worked in an office. So, you know, but, Learning by doing, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's great. I think you were very brave, but you did the right thing. Right. Yeah, braver, th- braver than I so am. Could you <laughs> just briefly tick off a few graduates from the Columbia School of Architecture <laughs> that we might be familiar with, besides the Kishin besides himself. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, you know, there are... Um, you know what? I, I actually... Uh, I don't think I'll even go there because I'm not it's it, I'm going to tell you something odd that I don't often say but since we're the conversation is going this in this direction I am you know in a way I can cons- I don't even consider myself fully to be an architect you know and I I don't mean that to say that I can't do it or I'm not interested in doing it but the things that interest me are Technical challenges, functional issues, social issues, um, big scale problems, small scale problems, but they don't align so much with the sort of conventional uh, or the sort of common architectural uh, uh, course or career. And so I actually don't read architectural magazines very much. I don't go. I don't go out to architectural. But you write for a lot. Them. I know you do. So I'm not so much in that world. Uh, I mean, right. a little bit. I sure, am. My sure. partner is very much, and that's one reason why I'm not. You know, Colin is. He's also teaches an academic, and I have many of the people I work with are really uh, sort of um, committed emotionally and intellectually to be architects in that sense. Me, that that's part of the my own. Um, sort of sense of why I'm still interested in what I do because Mm. I'm not exactly a normal architect. I'm figuring out my own job. I'm figuring out technical issues. Sure. You know, the reason why I asked was because when I think of Columbia School of Architecture, Mm. before we met, 
The only connection I could possibly make was Art Garfunkel. He went there? He did. But he never practiced art. No, he didn't. Oh, okay. No, he didn't. So it was an unusual person to mm -hmm. say, that guy's an architect? Look at him. Yeah, he's singing. Okay. He's now an actor. He's... Yeah. And then don't we have some Pritzker Prize winners from <laughs> the school, it's, et cetera, et cetera? It's a great, you know, architecture actually is a great generalist profession uh, and background for um, almost anything else. And in fact, that's one of the, the essential um, aspects of architecture is you, as an architect, you coordinate a team of people who do many different things, right. you know, and the ability to do that efficiently and hopefully creatively and so on is is one of the key aspects sure. of it. So it, it, it's actually, you know, oddly a good preparation for all kinds of things, like becoming a, you know, <laughs> folk rock <laughs> megastar, I suppose. Well, you know, because I, the reason why I'm following along that trail is because I want to get to how we met and the subject matter of what brought us together because yeah. uh, I my only experience with architecture before that was you know Tinker Toys and Lego and then all of a sudden I was invited downtown by one of your professors Richard Pluns to give a presentation before the third year class before they actually chose a studio to go to the faculty has to sort of seduce them into joining their group mm -hmm. to participate in a project and in fact the um, I couldn't understand for the life of me while I was, why I was invited to do that. So, well, how long ago would this be? This was back in 1999, before the vertical farm concept. Or? That's exactly. Well, at, at the very beginning of it. Okay, got it. So, in 2000, I believe that it was actually 2000 that I went downtown. I agreed to do this without knowing a clue as to what I was agreeing to. Mm. And so, when I got there, they said, "Just tell us a story about." And then they said, oh, about your specialty. And so I'm a parasitologist. Right? I, mean, was, I was still actively teaching here at the medical school. Mm. And so what I decided to do was to tell them how the outhouse was invented. Yeah, hookworm. As an architectural yeah. Very good. <laughs> engineering That's combination yeah. that cured a whole series of diseases yeah. without yeah. actually knowing how they were transmitted except for one. And it covered a whole bunch That's of others. Cool. And then after that, <laughs> you know, I sort of met all these other architects down there, like, uh, um, I forget his first name, but uh, Frampton. Um, oh, Ken Frampton. Ken sure, Frampton, yeah. who was as esoteric a person as I've ever met, but still brilliant, mm -hmm. and published books on tectonic, architectural tectonics, which mm -hmm. I thought, of course, really did somehow to plate tectonics. So I bought the book, and I opened it up, and I started to read it, and I got past the first paragraph, and I thought it was, this is not in English. <laughs> this book has got to be written in some other language, but I can read the words. I just don't understand how they're put together. And then somehow, we got connected. You know, it, it was it was not that way, actually. And by the way, I want to I want to congratulate you um, on uh, obviously uh, a a sort of gut appreciation for the the architectural discourse. I mean, Ken Frampton actually was one of the sort of major figures in at Columbia at that time. Um, and uh, when I was there, Bob Stern being the other sort of in this, they had this actually very kind of wonderful and creative uh, debate about architecture style, etc., and so on. And um, and they're both out there working still, you know. Sure. God bless them. <laughs> and anyway, but uh, I missed that event. I guess I didn't even know about it. And but uh, but I I we met because I read about you somewhere. Uh -oh. uh, I read some. <laughs> reference to vertical architecture it must have been one of the very first mm -hmm. ones yeah, that early, I don't remember early, early. what uh, it was early publication it was in but I, I called you up and visited you up here not yes, so no, far I, away I, from I do this that. room actually. Mm -hmm. do remember that. and that was a, a very inspiring and important moment well, for me I, I must say no I totally agree with you because once I was connected to a professional that was outside of the school of you know, Columbia University, because Gordon, not Gordon Graff, I, I didn't mean to mention that name, who was another architecture student in, uh, up in Toronto, but um, uh, Andrew Cranus was the student of Richard Pluns, who I mm -hmm. co-directed through the iteration of the first vertical mm -hmm. farm, mm -hmm. okay? And it was highly impractical, but very ar artistic and very functional but not very high-yield productivity boys. That's the sort of thing. But it attracted a lot of attention, and perhaps maybe there was an article written about it or something like that that said 
the heck is a vertical farm? You know, how could you possibly make a building do something other than what they ordinarily do? And that is to house people or store things in. Here we are. We're going to grow stuff inside of a tall mm-hmm. building. And wow, that's... You know, the moment we thought about it, then the, the class that I taught began to think more about it also. And the whole thing just snowballed. I got invitations to talk at Arup and to uh, the company that uh, Grimshaw, uh, incorp- uh, they were the ones that designed and helped design the Eden Project over in England. The next thing you know, I was sort of being dragged into these fields that I had no knowledge of whatsoever, and they were very forgiving. I must say that everybody that I talked with said, you don't have to know anything about architecture. That's our job. He says, we want to know how you intend to use your concept uh, in a built environment, and so then, and we can help you do that. That's what we're here for. And that the rest of that story happened. We ended up in Dubai, as I recall, uh, at the well, Tall Building Conference. <laughs> with Well, with a couple important stops before then. Sure. So, I mean, actually, you know, I think that your, um, your investigation into vertical farming, which came from a completely different direction than my interest in that kind of thing, intersected in a very timely way, I think, with what, what I was doing. Because having started out, having started my uh, architectural career working with solar panels and that technology, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, I was immediately uh, intrigued and inspired about the idea, well, okay, here's this uh, this panel, which in this case is basically a piece of laminated glass. It has a couple wires coming out the back. Glass is one of the most common and lowest cost and most durable building materials there is. So surely there is a way to combine these two functions and there's a nice symbiotic relationship and so on and so forth. So that early work that we had been doing starting in the uh, early 80s in solar and how to integrate it into uh, architecture uh, was a fascinating problem. It was fun. It created opportunities and all kinds of things. But it also got me thinking about other issues so but in a, in a very pragmatic way you know this whole sustainable mm-hmm. thing it for for me has never been a moralistic issue which it is for many people rightly <laughs> it is a moral issue yeah. but in my case it was a pragmatic one okay how do we uh, integrate solar panels with buildings so that they work well look good cost hopefully little or nothing more than a normal building would and you know what a great bunch of of goals but at the same time when you think about those things you think about daylight generally okay your the solar panels want light uh, on them as much as possible but of course we need light for ourselves in our in our uh, rooms and buildings and so what's the balance between those two you think about daylight you think about view you think about okay view we open the windows there's the wind out there how do we capture that how do we use that resource so in in my case it was kind of a um uh, a following a series of leads to how can we really make our projects work with and symbiotically with nature in every way. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the emphasis on solar led, uh, amongst many other things, to an interest in um, plants and how do you integrate those with a building because plants, after all, are solar panels too. Uh, and all kinds of potential uh, to to use them in a sort of architectural way in our work. And following that road, the kind of ult- ultimate application of growing plants in or on buildings is growing food. So we were at kind of at that point in our own thinking when you came along. And so hmm. the so, rest is history. <laughs> not yet, I hope. No, what, not yet. Maybe you could, what does it mean to be a self-sustaining building? What, what it, I mean, I, I kind of have an idea, but... What is the definition in your, from your view? That's a great question, and I think it's. Uh, I don't think there is a single clearly accepted um, answer to that. In fact, to me, one one issue that that kind of drives me crazy is the um, lack of precision about the words we use to talk about mm-hmm. sustainability, green, and so on. Like, what does sustainable mean? You know. Uh, I think to most people today, a sustainable building, a green building, is something that either has uh, been awarded a point or a rating by a, a rating system. And in most cases, that means something that is a little bit better 
than normal practice, something that uses a little bit less energy, something that uses less water, discharges less waste, and so on and so forth. But the term sustainability, it seems to me, it's a very simple term. I mean, something that's sustainable is something that has to be able to continue forever, right? I mean, it's not a degrading system. It's something that is stable and so on. And uh, so what sustainability should mean is something that is uh, today, even today, uh, considered at the very high end of sort of green building practice. And so using the term self-sustaining is maybe a little bit more specific. And it has to do with the question of what is the proper scale of sustainability? What do we consider when we talk about it? And so on. And in my work, it, I've always tried to, um, to consider everything. Uh, so uh, if we mean self-sustaining in terms of energy, we should generate all the energy that is used in a building on site by clean renewable sources and in fact we've come to realize as time has passed that we need to do even better than that because if you're just cons you know powering the lights the air conditioner the computers in a building you're ignoring this enormous amount of energy that went into building the building in the first place and maintaining and so on so our conception of what sustainability self-sustaining means has evolved over time to cover all of that so we want to be have this comprehensive view of uh, these environmental issues and if we say we're going to do something and I think we have to if we're going to build our buildings and infrastructure and society to be sustainable, we have to cover all of those issues. And that's what mm -hmm. self-sustaining means today. As a, to me. as a footnote, uh, just today, Bill Gates Jr. announced a program of about two and a half billion dollars worth of money that he solicited from other billionaires to invent for once and for all a sustainable uh, passive energy capture system with long-term storage batteries, et cetera, to make sure that fossil fuels never come up on that table again as a, an alternative to the way you conduct business. And so that's a remarkable turnaround from, let's say, 10 years ago when everybody was figuring out how much oil there is left and how much uh, mm -hmm. gas mm -hmm. and stuff like this. Next thing you know, <laughs> the technologies have outstripped all of those, right? I mean, are you not amazed at how far photovoltaics have come in the last 10 years? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's been really interesting. You know, we... Or LED lights. Or, I mean, going back uh, 20, 30 years to the early days of our practice, we were making certain predictions about uh, where the technology would be, about the, the notion that renewables could become a significant part of the world's energy mix in our lifetimes, or even the dominant or even the only source of energy. And back then... Almost nobody uh, thought that that was possible <laughs> or that if it was, it was generations in the future. Mm -hmm. And along with that came issues about technical issues like the efficiency of different technologies, um, the cost. Right. Now, what has uh, completely proved almost everyone wrong going back 20, 30 years has been the, the cost evolution. Yeah. Not so much the, the technology, the efficiency, but the cost. And this has a lot to do with the globalization of the industry, the, the entry of China and the Far East into it. And so... And Germany. Don't forget Germany. Oh, too. yeah, sure. I mean, government policies, national Whole country, programs. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, right. So there's been there's been this interesting mixture of sort of support, uh, you know, uh, carrots and sticks, you know, from different parts of the world. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, ma the major factor has really been this, uh, this sort of incredible um, drop in cost yeah, because yeah. of China. And so increase in efficiency. We are, you know, we are well on our way on a path that, that nobody thought we would be on this soon. Yeah, uh, thank goodness. So would it, it, how far in the future will it be possible to have a building that can supply its own Electricity, for example, only electricity. Well, today, we today? I mean, there are some examples. Yeah. There's, there's not many, mm -hmm. but uh, one of the things we we studied uh, have looked at in a number of projects. Well, basically every project we undertake, our attitude is that okay, we have our normal 
tasks as architects of designing a building that's functional in budget and then you know is aesthetically uh, pleasing or wonderful or beautiful uh, and and so on. But um, in addition to all that, you know, we have always taken as one of our core motivations mm-hmm. and principles the environmental ones like we so we want our buildings to be as efficient as possible to use as few resources as little energy water etc as possible and um it, along with that to generate renewable energy where possible via integrated photovoltaics or whatever other possible technologies there are so our attitude has always been what is the best possible solution technically architecturally functionally to any project we take on and very interestingly um there's been a lot of progress on on both sides of that equation for buildings in recent years. In addition to the uh, dramatic drop in the cost of solar, there has been a dramatic rise in uh, building efficiency, Mm. mainly in the form of this uh, wonderful German program called Passive House that is becoming popular around the world, which actually has plenty of uh, precedence in work actually done in Mm. this country in the 70s, super insulated buildings and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we are now at a point where already today, You have the potential for uh, a building, even in New York City, where you might have a lot of surrounding buildings and shading Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that uses so little energy that it can generate all of its energy. And this is a we could be we could be talking about, say, a four story building already generating all the energy it uses from a solar roof alone. So we are there. There aren't many real ones, but. We're there. Ask, could ask Dr. Racaniello about his own house. <laughs> yeah, that's oh. a good, but what about, a, I will ask, what about a 50-story building? Is that possible? Well, I did a little thumbnail calculation <laughs> uh, some time ago, and I think that in by about... 2050, 2100. I mean, you're starting to get far enough in the future that it's a little tricky to make these projections. But if we talk about a tall building and just the roof area, so in other words, how many times um, the uh, demand of one square meter of solar Mm -hmm. roof can you supply? I think we could get up to 25, 27 stories just from the roof. But the roof in a building like that is a very small part of the building. And so what becomes much more interesting uh, in that type of building, and here we are talking about, you know, urban environments, which is the fastest growing part of the world and a tricky and interesting problem for architects, is to uh, use whatever service of the building is appropriate mm. uh, that has the solar resource and so on. So, vertical facades uh, incorporating photovoltaics uh, can make a lot of sense. And we've, uh, you know, we have done projects that use those elements. We have not yet had a chance to do the really big ones, but mm. we have designed projects that. Uh, can be entirely energy self-sustaining. That can be very, very yeah. tall. So we, we uh, I was sitting in the airport lounge at Newark about six months ago, and a guy came up to me from NRG Solar. He said, "Do you want to put solar into your house?" I said, "Well, I, and I was in Home Depot, and the guy said we had too many trees." You know, he said, "No." He looked at it on his GPS. He said, oh, it looks okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no cost. You can have five thousand miles. Okay, fine. So we're in the now we're we're well along. We've already cut down a lot of trees. The problem with in New Jersey, the trees grow very tall because they compete with one another, mm-hmm. and then there's a little cap at the top, so there's a lot of shade. Mm-hmm. And they only want to put panels on the southern exposure of the roof. And uh, we're still, you know, we cut a bunch down. It's very expensive to cut trees down. Mm. And they came back and said, eh, we'd like you to cut more. And I'm just thinking, <laughs> really expensive. I mean, initially they were going for a 50% um, supp- uh, supplying of our electricity. But the other 50% would come from their solar farms. Mm-hmm. So once you buy into their program, mm-hmm. they, they they have farms all over the country and they will give you electricity at about half the price of what New Jersey can supply it to mm-hmm. you for. So that seemed good on its own, but I would like to be able to get more. And it turns out that you know there are different kinds of panels, that I'm sure you know, and the ones they initially offered us, the cheaper kind, generate less electricity <laughs> than the more expensive ones. Mm-hmm. And we, the way it works is you pay a, a certain amount of money a month, I think it was $70 a month, to basically pay for their installation and their upkeep of the panels, and that's much less than an electricity bill. So, I mean... I said to my wife, "Do you really want to cut down these trees?" And she said, "Well, I want to make I want to do my part towards um, 
you know, sustainability and at least make some of the electricity. Because, you know, the, the big nuclear plant in New Jersey is going offline in a couple of years and mm-hmm. our rates are going to go up because we're going to have to purchase electricity. So I, I think it's really nice, but, you know, it, with trees, it's a problem. We're not in a city where... Well, I guess in the city you have other well, buildings, right? You know, it's not a I mean, I'm not I I, I love solar, I love sustainable buildings mm. and so on, but I would I certainly wouldn't say that uh you have to do it everywhere. And yeah. there are places where it's inappropriate because of uh as for aesthetic reasons or a sort of cultural context or other practical reasons. And you know, the decision to cut trees down is a is a serious one. Yeah, sure. You know, it's uh I mean I think you're if I had a house surrounded by big enough trees to shade the roof, I'm not sure what I would do, you know? And it may be that, um, you know, I might accept uh, some lower level of performance from yeah, the solar. Yeah. You know, it depends on how thick the shade is and so on. But uh, it's uh, it's it's a, a case-by-case basis. Well, it's, the suburbs are, are, these things are blossoming. I see them all over now where I, I didn't see them five years ago at all. People are putting them on their roof and going to be the guy said at some point all the houses are going to have it so it's not going to make a difference on your resale value even Mm -hmm. and it will make some contribution because he said the problem is it's too expensive i maintain my subscription to science magazine Mm. (laughs) which is a paywall type of magazine we've talked about this in other podcasts but but there are numerous articles over the last year using a, a a new compound that they've discovered it's called perovskite Mm-hmm. And perovskite uh, can be cut into thin sheets, and it can be partnered with silicone to improve the efficiency of already mm-hmm. efficient solar panels. It jumped from about 20% up to about 28% just by the addition of this uh, compound that they've discovered uh, that that uh, obviously traps photons and converts them to electricity more, more efficiently than, than any other compounds that they've investigated so far. Mm-hmm. So very soon... Uh, those solar panels that you've got on your roof may very well be displaced by a newer, more sure, efficient, cheaper uh, version. So the the model that I loved was the one I heard about in Oxford, England. I was over at a conference about a year ago, and there was a company over there that was renting solar panels. They weren't selling them; they were renting. No, they don't. We don't buy them. We rent it. From you them. do rent them. Yeah. Okay, fine. That's the yeah. best model because when an improvement comes along, they'll just switch them out and and yeah. put in the more efficient ones. So I think that's that's great. Plus. You've got geothermal, and I know that the New York chapter of AIA, which is the American Architecture American Institute of Architecture in the village, has a hole that goes down 1,500 feet into the ground and traps mm. all of its energy from geothermal. Mm. Every bit of it comes from geothermal. Don't now, I don't do know what more? the option is for other people, but that's, well, that's pretty cool, I thought. Well, I, I have to correct you on that, on oh? that one, Dixon. Sorry, but uh, oh, no. it's – in fact, yeah. that's another one of those um, <laughs> sort of deceptive words that we use too much is geothermal too, which to me, true geothermal energy is um, – you know, drilling a hole down and there's like hot rock down there and you can run water through it and get steam (laughs) and actually generate energy that way. The kind of geothermal you're referring to, and the word is used for it, uh, but to me, the the word that I prefer to use is a ground source heat pump, you know. So this is a a way of uh, more efficiently moving heat around uh and so what it does instead of a typical air condition and this you know the direction we're moving in inevitably if we want to become a if if we want to deal with climate change is to become a basically an all-electric society powered by renewable energy and the way that we are going to be heating and cooling our buildings is using heat pumps which uh, are um, much more efficient than, you know, if you think of an electric heater or something, it's an extremely inefficient way to create heat. But what a heat pump does, it doesn't create heat, it moves it around. So it takes, in the winter, it takes heat out of, in most cases, out of the air and brings it into your building. And in the summer, it does the opposite, it takes heat from inside and puts it outside. Right. But it's it's quite inefficient to do that, to t- be pulling heat in and out of the air, 
uh, it's much more efficient to be pulling it in and out of the ground where you have a very stable temperature of around 50 degrees. So in the, you know, in the, in the um, winter, you're beginning with a much warmer temperature and it's, it's also more efficient to conduct heat uh, to a solid than to the air. So for all those reasons, it, that's one of the things we can do in terms of our mechanical systems to make our buildings much more efficient. Right. So it's, it's not a generation technology, it's an efficiency technology. <laughs> no, thank you for clarifying yes, that, uh, Dr. Cash. Yes. Well, <laughs> almost everyone has that so, understanding. I have, I have two so. topics that we would love to get to, because I know the, the listeners are right now saying, what's all of this got to do with vertical farming? So could you please describe your involvement, your company's involvement with the uh, Manhattan School for Children project, which has as its main feature a rooftop fill-in-the-blank? Okay. Greenhouse Classroom. And this is also a right. great way to reconnect our stories because, um, you know, it's funny, as I, as I get older and older, I find <laughs> myself forgetting more and more. But I think it's a really good sign, Dixon, that I find myself remembering our early contacts quite vividly when I've forgotten a lot of other th important things that happened in those years. So after our first meeting, you actually introduced me to the Science Barge. Which, right. remember that? Yes, and I do. Yes, sure the do. Science Barge was this, uh, still is this wonderful project, a, um, a barge. In the, at that time, it was uh, docked in the Hudson River, although it moved around, that was run by a group called New York Sunworks, a fellow <laughs> called Ted Kaplow, set it up to demonstrate uh, off grid um, uh, greenhouse hydroponic agriculture. Yep. So it had a small greenhouse on it, it was powered by. Um, sun and wind, although Correct. almost entirely by sun. There's an interesting <laughs> aside there. The wind turbines, even out in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the East River, rarely yeah, worked yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, but it, it uh, captured rainwater, it desalinated river water. So it was this entirely self-contained... And used biodiesel also. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it had this wonderful greenhouse growing beautiful yep. vegetables hydroponically, which was correct. like, wow, that was right. my introduction to it. And, you know, I'm eternally grateful <laughs> that you took me and my office over there. And then what we did is uh, the next step in this saga was actually we were so inspired by that, that, you know, in the way we like to work, well, can we integrate this stuff into architecture somehow, right. this hydroponic stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so we actually working with, uh, my office working with Dixon and New York Sunworks, um, did an entry for the, the Buckminster Fuller Institute competition that year. And I don't even remember what year it was, but it was a lo pretty long time ago. Um, and you know, the Bucky Fuller Institute is, uh, is, has a competition program where they're looking for projects that really address big scale social, technical, environmental issues and pr present really innovative solutions and so on. So our proposal was to take the, uh, uh, hydroponic, the dominant hydroponic technology, which is called uh, NFT, nutrient film technique, trays. So these are horizontal plastic trays that uh, you grow things in, typically lettuces. Uh, and uh, they normally sit in horizontal rows next to each other in a greenhouse. And our thought was, okay, what if we want to do this in the middle of New York City and a skyscraper or something? Let's take these trays and sort of install them in a vertical kind of conveyor belt system that would travel up the facade of a building in a sort of double skin glass wall. So there are buildings out there that have double skin facades for energy efficiency reasons and so on. They don't usually work that well, but if you take one and put this um, hydroponic growing system in it, you get all kinds of benefits. You can grow vegetables, of course, which is great and they have value, uh, but also you can have this whole complicated system interface with the building in ways that pr produce all kinds of benefits. So in hot weather, there is some evaporative cooling effect as the uh, plants transpire water and evaporate and that kind of thing. So you can, um, you can actually capture some uh, cool air from these in a building in hot weather. In uh, cold weather, of course, they need to be heated. And if you were growing something in a greenhouse, they would be heated anyway. Um, you, there is this exchange, this very basic exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen between <laughs> plants and people, right? So in a building like the room Dude. we're in right now, the Dude. CO2 level is quite high, right? It's probably 900 parts per million Growing. or something. <laughs> That's right. And if you take, and plants love that, 
right? That's what they grow on. So if you take the exhaust from a building and sort of put that stale air into the greenhouse, the greenhouse is going to, the plants will grow that much better and faster. And then if you take the air coming out the other end of this, let's say this 10 story high, double skin vertical greenhouse, that is fresh oxygenated air coming exactly. from the, uh, exactly. you know, conditioned thermally coming back into the building. Right. So there's all kinds of cool, plus you can use these um, trays, these plastic or metal trays that the plants are growing in as sun control devices in a way like a giant like a large scale venetian blind you know so that you can because the way we uh designed this particular system the whole thing rotates uh very slowly so that so that you don't have to be climbing up and down in front of everybody's office windows or bedrooms or whatever the building is the you stand at the bottom of this thing Mm. you plant your plants it takes about a month for it to make its trip around and so you by the time it has made its trip around you've got a full-grown plant you're harvesting and then you just plant a new one there so we have this this very cool idea of this kind of dynamic uh, Mm. nft hydroponic system that could be integrated into buildings so we didn't win for some reason. I don't know why, but you know, we didn't have a man on the uh, or woman on the jury, the jury. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will eventually. No, we couldn't do it that way. Anyway. And we we actually have okay. So then um, to get back to the story, so we we did that working all together as a team, and um, not long after the science barge, it for it, interestingly for environmental reasons, it couldn't stay permanently moored anywhere because it is actually damaging to the ecosystem. It's now up in Yonkers, by the way. Right. Fortunately, in Yonkers, it's okay. <laughs> they I don't, don't know. have a law against that. In Manhattan, it was a problem. <laughs> so yes, it is now permanently in, up in Yonkers, and right. it's well worth visiting. Yeah. Uh, and then New York Sunworks, as their next step, uh, went uh, onto land and uh, dis- decided that the thing to do was to... Um, uh, promote uh, greenhouses at schools because the, a lot of people visited the science barge were very inspired as we were uh, and so um, one group of parents at uh, PS333 the Manhattan School for Children really pushed uh, for uh, a greenhouse to be built on their uh, their rooftop and Long story short, it happened. It's not an easy thing to do, navigating the bureaucracy, raising the money. Uh, it costs enormously more to build a greenhouse on a New York City public school than it does you know, out in a field in yeah. New Jersey. And, but they got it done. And in the process, they actually ended up um, teaming with New York Sunworks. New York Sunworks itself kind of went through uh, some changes and split into one piece that it continues to do these school rooftop projects. And then other... Uh, groups that have gone into the commercial world of rooftop hydroponic farming, like you know Gotham Greens and uh, um, mm-hmm. uh, Bright Farms, mm-hmm. and so on. So it's uh, a whole community was created out of that group back in the day. So the school now uses that greenhouse to teach STEM to all of mm-hmm. their grade levels. This is an, a real greenhouse. It's, it's a giant. Yeah, it's, it's a real. Glass, you right. can get it online, and it's uh, so it's it's year round. Yeah, it is sure. And you've talked about this, right? I have. And yeah. I've visited them many times and, you know, given presentations. How big is it? Uh, I don't know. 1,500. the designers. 1,500 <laughs> square feet. Okay. He built it. Yeah, which is which is the size of a typical science classroom in a public school in New York City. Yeah. It's about 750 square feet. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of like two science classrooms. Okay. But the way it's configured is about half of it is greenhouse stuff, uh, different types of growing systems, plus aquaponics. There's a tank with Mm -hmm. fish Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, work with to provide nutrients for the plants. And then half of it it roughly is a lab classroom space. And, you know, it is it is so inspiring. It's uh, just such a great feeling to see a place like this in action. I mean, kids love it. Truly. Yeah. They are so inspired. They do great work. And so, you know, this hmm. notion of in, in everything we've done, uh, I've, I've always felt like the idea of multifunction, the idea of multiple benefits to doing something, like if you do one thing, you often don't know what the right thing is to do when you're trying to solve problems, right? But to me, one of the surest signs that you are doing the right thing is you solve one problem and you find out that you're actually solving <laughs> another and another at the same well, time. that's the outhouse story that I gave to begin with, right? Exactly. You didn't know how these diseases were transmitted, but if you trapped one of them six feet down into a hole, 
you trapped a whole bunch of others that couldn't crawl out also. So, you know, the unintended consequences, they usually talk about negative unintended, but these are positive unintended consequences that once you've done one thing correct, everybody else gets their own idea of what the next correct thing is. And these kids have taken this idea way beyond whatever we thought that would ever happen mm -hmm. uh, and have designed projects on plant nutrition and the relationship between sunlight and tilapia production versus, uh, you know, whether we should grow spinach or radicchio or kale in the windows, all kinds of questions. I, re I remember hearing a story from one of the teachers that when they first had produce, and they picked it and sent it home with the kids. <laughs> the parents were addressing their kids, where did you get, did you get that? that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we, we grew it ourselves, Ma. Oh, no, you didn't. I couldn't possibly. So the next day, they brought them up on the roof and showed them. I'm looking at it on your website. You've mm -hmm. got a page uh, it's quite, devoted to it. It's quite wonderful, uh, and it'll be there beautiful. forever, basically. It's a really big school building. It I didn't is. Realize it. Mm -hmm. This little green thing on one of the lower structures. Mm -hmm. yeah. The building right. goes up much further. Quite. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Quite nice. yeah. Well, it's it's a great space to be in. I mean, you, you walk in there, you feel good, just even if no one else is there. It's just true. being in the presence of all those plants and growing yeah, things. Yeah. But no, we it, should do an episode. There. You got, you got love to. to. We'd love to do that. Yeah. Would they let us go? Oh, of course. They would some encourage kids us. and the teachers. Yeah, and, no, they so, would love so your to firm it. was involved in the design of this? Is we designed right? it, yes. Okay. we Because we had this, we were lucky to meet these people early on and we uh we were you know very uh, eager partners in mm -hmm. the in the okay. program and we've continued to work with them so Wonderful. you know although by some standards these are small projects yeah. and they're very tricky and difficult and there's all kinds of regulations and issues involving the school and the city and unions and you know regulations yeah. and fire alarm ancient fire alarm systems and whatever uh, <laughs> we continue to to love to do these projects and we've uh, done we actually um, in uh, Friday on Friday in uh, three days uh, PS 84 mm -hmm. uh, is opening which is another uh, very similar 1500 square foot hydroponic greenhouse nice. in a school in Williamsburg oh terrific great project uh, and uh, and we have several others underway there's enormous oh, nice. interest in this nice every school should have one you bet. Actually, there's really no question that every school should have one. And New York Sunworks actually has done many more of a sort of interim type of project where they set up a, they take an existing classroom and they set up a hydroponic sure. uh, facility inside it. So it's not as good in a sense uh, or as dramatic as having a greenhouse, a proper greenhouse, mm -hmm. but you can still do it. You may have to use grow lights and yeah. so on. Yeah. But they've they've done many of those, and uh, and there are I mean we are actually involved with I think uh, five other uh, rooftop greenhouse That's school projects. So. They should have them in the suburbs too. Darn right. I mean, it'd be easier even well, if you put it next to the school. Yes. Right? yes. In Newark, sure. I know that uh, Aerofarms uh, began humbly at the Phillips Academy as a small demonstration project, mm -hmm. and uh, they grew into what they're going to become over the next three months. One of I mean, the largest could, indoor for, vertical farms. I can imagine that kids love to plant things and grow do. And experiment so, it would be okay great, so yeah. that's one that's one mm -hmm. iteration how are you going to get people on board for even accepting whether or not hydroponically grown food is healthy for you all right so you teach it to the students and you show them the difference you start at the young age that's like the young anything age. else yeah so the yeah. other project that i would love you to you're going to do more than mention i hope is the 2020 building that uh, okay. competition that you started to enter into and before that building was designed before we met. Yes. And right. then after we met, right. it got redesigned. Right. And so I, I love that part of that story, of course, because it involves uh, vertical farming. Yeah. So please. Well, okay. This is, uh, we have a project uh, originally called the 2020 Tower uh, that has now become the 2050 Tower. Right. <laughs> it being almost 2020 by now. But uh, this is something that goes back to the uh, summer of 2001. In August, mid-August of 2001, I was contacted by the National Building Museum, which is in Washington, D.C., and is a wonderful institution. Uh, they, do, they have an amazing building. They do great programs and so on. And they were putting together uh, an exhibit called Big and Green. And uh, at that time, I think the, uh, the, the curators putting it together began to realize that, I mean, the idea of it was not to show, like, houses out in the country, but to show sort of big commercial institutional buildings that are green buildings. They realized pretty quickly that 
there weren't very many of them, unfortunately, to show. So uh, it, w- it took some research, and, and they contacted us partly because we had some projects already to show. We had just recently, um, or we were working on the Stillwell Avenue Terminal, a large photovoltaic integrated uh, subway terminal down in Coney Island, for example. And so that was in the show. But they asked us as well to, uh, and ended up asking us to design a hypothetical big green project like what could a big green building really look like so we were sort of mulling this problem over in uh, late august of 2001 and then uh, of course in uh, september 11th happened and you know our we were quite close by literally both you know sort of physically and spiritually to the whole thing as many of us were we were actually, my office was, uh, although it was this bright, brilliantly blue sky day, uh, we were directly downwind from the World Trade Center. So when it collapsed, we were in that plume of smoke and dust and so on. And it was like, you know, uh, like London fog or something. And naturally, that had a big influence on certainly this big and green project we were working on, because it was Im- immediately apparent to me, as to many other people, that, you know, what were the, re- why did it happen, you know? And it had a lot to do yeah. with things like oil and economics and, you know, politics and power and mm-hmm. energy and all kinds of things. So that was one issue that, well, okay, shouldn't we address those sorts of things in our buildings and infrastructure? For example, reducing the need for foreign oil for you know, any number of reasons. And then there were just obvious, obvious other issues like watching those towers burn, you know, and you could see, okay, there was this, you know, these planes had cut through the tower and it was pretty clear anybody above there was in big trouble. You know, we didn't know they were going to collapse at that time. And, you know, so certain things that just seem so obvious to me. At, well, if you remember, that event was such a shock that people were saying in all seriousness afterwards, well, we're never going to build tall buildings again, <laughs> you know. And there was all kind, you know, it, there was a, it was a very traumatic uh, period, obviously. And it was pretty clear to me that people were going to build tall buildings again. But the question is, you know, can you do it in a better, more sensible, safer way, as well as a more sustainable way? So all of those thoughts informed our 2020 tower project. So, for example, having watched those towers come down, I realized that I would never design a tall, a super tall building that has only one way out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, basically that is the the plan of pretty much every single skyscraper that's ever been built. There's a core in the middle and there's space around it, which is for offices or apartments or what have you. And, you know, the reality of what's happened since then has been so disappointing to me. I mean, there's been, so, you know, on Ground Zero, for example, they talk about, well, reinforcing the core and having clearer, uh, you know, exit paths and better ventilation systems and stuff. But, you know, it's still just one way out. And so what we found as we kind of reformulated the project for the National Building Museum is that we we decided, okay, we are going to uh, design a building to be really big and really green and really safe that would be the size of the same number of square feet as the Twin Towers, as Mm -hmm. the World Trade Center, but in a single much taller building. So we decided to be uh, make it a dramatic example that it would be by far the tallest building in the world. <laughs> so we said, okay, we're going to do a 150-story building. The World Trade Center buildings were 110 stories. So at that time, it would have been by far the tallest building in the world, and we're going to make it zero energy, and we're going to make it a, <laughs> we're going to make it safer and more sustainable in, in every way possible. So it's going to have on-site waste treatment so that we can reuse and recycle water. Uh, we're generating all our energy, as I say. We're going to make it also socially sustainable, so it's going to be a mixed-use building. It's going to be a building of that size becomes the size of a small town or a, almost a small city. So we're going to make it a vertical city. We're going to have it have be a similar mix of uses to the city as a whole, which is going to make it both more socially interesting than if it had just been an office building where, you know, 20,000 people show up at nine o'clock and 20,000 people <laughs> leave at five yeah. o'clock and then it's just sitting there, right? Um, this way, wow. it's it's a mix that is going to be active 24 uh, hours a day. Want to move in, Dixon? Absolutely. 
we can be on you floor bet. as a bookie yeah, show. I want to yeah. do it. I want to do it. Just to give people an idea, it's almost seven million square feet right. of space. Yeah, that's a, that's yeah. more or less what the world. Trade. Yeah, the twin towers were wow. about that size. Wow. <laughs> So, you know, we, anyway, it's, there's an awful lot to talk about. We don't have time to go into, but basically what we did is do two parts. Let's buy all day. I'll talk about it all day if you have the time. Uh, So we took, what we did is we, um, for a number of reasons, Mm -hmm. we took the plan, the World Trade Center towers were squares, 200 feet on a side with a single core in the middle. In our new 2020 tower, we uh, posited that we wanted it to be a, thin building for various reasons. Like in the World Trade Center, you have a zone about, say, 30 feet around the perimeter where you have views and you have daylight, right? You know, windowed offices or what have you. Inside of that, there's another 30 or 40 Mm -hmm. feet uh, that doesn't have views or daylight or anything, but is still being used by people. And it's that is, you know, very second class space, right? Mm -hmm. What we said is that, okay, and, but there were, it traditionally were good reasons for building buildings mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. So basically, because you are losing energy through a building's facade, you want as little of it as possible. So mm-hmm. really, a circular plan would be yeah. the most energy efficient because you have minimized the energy losing facade. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, the facade is expensive, right? So there, that's why skyscrapers have basically always been built that way. But there's a whole paradigm shift going on if we have these new materials if our facade now can generate renewable energy Mm -hmm, if you can have mm -hmm. a solar facade that is generating clean electricity at little or no cost premium to a conventional one then all of a sudden combining that with advances in insulation and thermal uh you know isolation and so on and so forth all of a sudden, you want as much of it as possible, not as l- little of it as possible. So what we ended up proposing, and when we'd gone through this exercise, we ended up, instead of this square, saying, okay, the building will never be thicker than about 15 meters or 20, uh, 60 feet deep, mm-hmm. uh, which is deep at the, the maximum depth at which you can have daylight and views throughout the whole building. Mm. And when we relayed the building out, we ended up with this sort of H-shaped plan where we had 60-foot deep sections of the building. <laughs> and, you know, and then we ended up splitting that single way out into two pieces because you now have a sort of a wide building. Right. And so you have two <laughs> cores instead of one and you put the stairs on the ends of the, the fingers and that kind of thing. So you have many ways out. And looking at it, we realized like, whoa, this is actually what we've done here is we've designed a sort of a 19th century building plan because before the advent of air conditioning right. and right. artificial lighting, sure. that's how buildings were built because mm-hmm. they had to be. So yeah. anyway, that was sort of the the basic motivation to do this. And that reflected this, um, this notion of multiple benefits of solving one, many problems with one solution, you know, like generating the renewable energy also gave us better quality space, gave us a safer building and so on and so forth. So tell us how you, you, you must put solar panels uh, on the side of the building, but don't impede be, people being able to look out. How do you do that? Well, what we what we assumed for, okay, so we called the project the 2020 tower, and this was in 2001. So that seemed f- pretty far in the future at that <laughs> point, but not so far in the future that we couldn't make fairly reasonable and accurate predictions about improvements in technology Mm, and you know a project of that size is going to take a long time to plan and build anyway so it's you know you might as well sort of take advantage of some improvement in in technology so we called it the 2020 tower and we uh we made the assumption that the building was uh the building facade was about half window glass and half non-window glass and Mm. that's called spandrel panels in building terminology so the spandrel panels could be the most efficient type of solar panel that we could assume Mm -hmm. and but we also assumed that even the window panels would Mm -hmm. be a type of solar photovoltaic transparent panel that was not available then and still basically isn't available today but we assumed a much lower efficiency and so on so Having made all those calculations and trying to be realistic about it, we took into account shading. We assumed that we we specifically did not say say that this was sited at ground zero because especially back then that was just too loaded emotionally mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. site, you yeah. know. But we said New York City climate 
And we said that, okay, it's going to be surrounded by 50-story buildings, a sort of average height. So there's going to be a lot of shading in the lower 50 floors. And, of course, the building shades itself. So we did actually accurate mm -hmm. simulations, mm -hmm. computer simulations of the uh, mm -hmm. insulation is the word, the amount of light uh, falling on the building. And with all that, with all the assumptions we made about the building efficiency and the solar efficiency, mm -hmm. we ended up with the vertical facade of the building generating about two-thirds of all the energy wow. required to operate the building. Mm -hmm. Now, that was short of our goal. Mm -hmm. So what we did then is, since it was a very tall building, we said, all right, we'll put some wind turbines at the top, mm -hmm. and those will generate the rest of the energy. And so that's what we ended up with. And it's a very cool looking thing, I think. Um, yeah, you have some pictures here of the turbines, I think. That we, but we came to regret, and that's in our second <laughs> chapter of the, <laughs> of the project, yeah. Now there's a lot of greenery here. This, is this for show or for eating? Well, there's different kinds of greenery. We, uh, <laughs> we decided, as I said, the building should be socially sustainable, a vertical city. So it has uh, a mixture of public and private spaces mm -hmm. in addition to a mixture of residential and commercial. So every 30 floors, which is a good increment in a building to uh, run building services, for example. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, you, you don't really want to be pumping water 150 stories at mm -hmm. one go, you know. So there's mechanical <laughs> floors every 30 floors. And associated with those, we have building setbacks. Mm -hmm. So we have each of these mechanical floors included in the 2020 tower, a biological waste treatment system, like a... a um, the uh, oh poster and a digester you mean yeah right I'm I'm uh, I'm <laughs> sleeping anaerobic, on the name. anaerobic digester anyway biological waste treatment that would treat uh, and allow us to reuse wow. most of the wastewater and sure. associated with those we had uh, living machines that's the word uh, of course uh, yes. that's one term John Todd's right uh, there would be setbacks so there would be outdoor space that you could go out on, they would be kind of parks in the sky. That would also be, because this was still fresh from 9-11, a place you could land a helicopter. So you would never be more than mm. about 15 floors away from a helicopter if wow. you really needed to be. Wow. And as well, we associated public space with those 30 yeah. uh, floor uh, increments of the building. So there would be something special like a hotel complex in one, a theater complex in another. We showed a, uh, a botanical garden in another. So, you know, creating the kind of mix of public, private spaces and uses that you would see in a city to make the mm -hmm. building uh, socially Can I have skydiving lessons? Vibrant. <laughs> well, sure. Why not? So this is a concept work, right? Yes. And it's an ongoing project? Well, it is. is it you know, that was not how we uh, expected it to go. We did yeah. this for this show, the right. Big and Green exhibit, which was uh, put. It was shown in 2003, and it traveled around to other places than the National Building Museum. But we found internally at my office at Kish and Cathcart that it was very useful to have as a kind of an ongoing in-house R&D project. But then it also had this surprisingly inspirational quality that got people thinking when they saw it, you know? And so it actually inspired a group of academics based at Rutgers who mm -hmm. ended up heading up a team uh, that uh, ended up obtaining actually two separate National Science Foundation grants to study mm -hmm. some of the issues around self-sustaining urban infrastructure and that kind of thing. So we actually continued to work on it with them, with the, our colleagues at Rutgers and also our up large engineering firm. Oh, nice. uh, and sort of Im improved it and looked at new issues and evolved our thinking about it. So these National Science Foundation grants actually went on over a long enough period that they just wrapped up a couple of years ago now. And at the end of that process, since enough time had elapsed, mm -hmm. we, uh, we upgraded the tower to the 2050 tower with new uh, assumptions about what is possible and also what our goals were. See, so from the original um, project where our ambition was only to generate the energy uh, to operate the building, mm -hmm. lights, heat, and so on, we realized that that was only part of the picture, that we really had to consider the embodied energy in building it and that kind of thing. So we also realized some other things like the wind turbines probably weren't going to work that well. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a, was sort of a surprise to our intuitive assumptions originally. So we changed around a number of things. Our basic 
criteria, moved the technology to 2050, somewhat more efficient solar. So we went from a, a 20% efficient solar system to a 30% efficient one and, it, and added vertical greenhouse elements to the project. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So part of our criteria now was to produce enough renewable energy to power the building and pay back the embodied energy and to grow enough fresh vegetables in the facade of the building to feed the inhabitants of the building when they were in the building. So mm-hmm. that means mm-hmm. for the residents, about 10,000 residents, their lunches and dinners they would have at home. And for the office workers, the lunches they would have mm-hmm. in the building. <laughs> and we can do all of that with our, with our, our wow. higher level of technology. We actually are providing the operating energy, paying back the embodied energy, growing enough uh, fresh produce to feed the mm-hmm. residents, and, and more. So it's a really interesting, you right. know, interesting Will, will anything like this ever get built? No. Yes. Yes, it inevitably it will. I mean, at some point, all of this stuff is going to become not just uh, possible, but inevitable. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there is there is no question, for example, that the building integrated photovoltaic facade, a solar facade, Mm -hmm. already there really is no reason why it shouldn't cost no more or even less than a lot of conventional building facades do. So basically, you're getting free renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And this Mm -hmm. goes to your point with your house in the trees, because at some point, if it doesn't cost you any more, if you get, you know, two kilowatt hours a year out of it, you're still gaining something yeah, you know yeah, yeah. so we can have the solar panels on the north facade of the building where they actually don't do so badly but obviously produce a lot less than yeah. on the south side and so right. on well and, i uh, think if you if you install it on construction you know there's a lot of new construction going on in the suburb mm-hmm. and it makes sense to do it at that point but i see nothing happening the roofs are just traditional roofs right i mean you could integrate it into the roof material yeah. right so greg and i sat in somebody's office i forget which chic it this was in abu dhabi <laughs> and this guy he was dressed up in his traditional garb uh but had been educated in i think in the united states and he turned to us at one point and says pardon my french <laughs> i looked at him, what <laughs> he says but he says here we are a country that pumps out two and a half million barrels of oil a day and we consume 300,000 barrels of that. That's like a chef that made a meal for friends and then ate a third of it himself. Mm. Right? So he says, and you look outside, you don't see one solar panel. He says, mm. this country is so rich in sunlight, we don't know what to do with it. We have to air condition every building. And I don't know, have you've been to the Middle East now several times mm-hmm. since then. Yeah. Has Abu Dhabi caught on to the fact that they can be solar independent? Well... Yes and no. Mm-hmm. Um, they are uh, they are both the the Emirates and Saudi and a lot of these Gulf states are investing in large renewable projects okay. in in wind, uh, but a lot of solar. But one thing that has not happened there and has not happened here, uh, which is a, a big surprise and disappointment to me is this real integration of Mm. the technology with our buildings and infrastructure. So now we're out to the third subject. So we've got the Manhattan School of Children out of the way. We've Mm -hmm. got the 2020 building nestled down into the infrastructure of the city. What kind of a city do you envision? I mean, you have to talk about the whole city now, right? So you have in front of you (laughs) the end result of a large think piece that um, I had a very small part in, and so did everybody else that's involved in this except the principals. And that is, how do you create an integrated city in which all the municipal functions are um, redundant, resilient, and uh, non-polluting? How do you do that? And food production, of course, is included in that. But now you're talking about energy, transportation. Yeah, but the problem is cities are old. You can't do it overnight. Well, I didn't say to do (laughs) it overnight. You can't replace all the buildings. But what choice do you have? Because they're just going to get older if you don't do anything. Well, right now, if you look at the skyline, you see lots of new buildings. And I'll bet none of them incorporate any of these things. No, no, no. You're right. I mean, we have a new one here going up uh, for Columbia. It's all glass. You should show them. The, the I will. Thing. I, mm, Oak glass, I will. and I'll bet there's not a panel in that thing mm. at sure. all. Yeah, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's crazy. It's ridiculous. It's short sighted. <laughs> but you know, the building industry is a very conservative one for mm. 
some good reasons and a lot of bad reasons. Uh, you know, the mm-hmm. good reasons are that, you know, you build a, you design, you build a building. Hopefully it will be there. It could be there for hundreds of years. You don't want it to leak. Mm. You don't want it to have other problems <laughs> 10, 20, 30 years from now. So people are very reluctant to do anything new when it comes to the building community. Let me just tell you, this building was built in the 70s. It's a piece of crap. <laughs> they, they had to put, they had to rebrick the entire exterior because it leaked. Like crazy. Well, you, Can you, know you imagine what? how much that cost? For less money, they could have put a f- solar facade on this building, yeah. I bet you. Here, here. You know? So, yeah, it's, it's, that is the, so it turns out that the problems and the, the, uh, the barriers are not so much technical and economic. They, are more, ha- they have more to do with um, awareness, um, uh, ambition, uh, mm. policy of different kinds, building codes. Contracts with builders that have a stake in the uh, yeah. outcome lawyers you know lawyers all kinds of, all kinds of things I, I once heard bloomberg say when he was mayor of new york city he has an engineering degree by the way he says new york city is in a horrible position right now he says we're a 21st century thinkers in a 19th century infrastructure well you know what you just have to change that you just have to bite the bullet and change it because otherwise you'll be a 22nd century thinkers in a 19th century infrastructure. And pretty soon, it'll be unlivable. The whole thing will just collapse. And that's happening all over the world. So how do you pay for these changes? That's a big question, right? How do you actually pay for them? That's a huge question. But also, you know, Vincent, to your comment about, well, looking at New York, that, I mean, yes, it's going to be difficult to Mm. upgrade our existing infrastructure. And we will have to do it if we want to uh, achieve some kind of climate balance. But... In what we were addressing in in the the, the study that uh, Dixon mentioned is something different, and that is that you know the uh, the growth in population in the world by 2050 means there's going to be you know a couple billion more people on the planet by then. They are almost all of them going to be in cities uh, because that's the right. way populations are moving. And what that means is that the creation of mm-hmm. new cities, whether they are extensions of existing ones or entirely new cities, is astounding. I mean, it's like, um, it's, a- it's the equivalent of uh, building a Providence, Rhode Island every day for the next 40 years, mm-hmm. or a New York <laughs> City every few months for the next 40 mm-hmm. years. So there is an awful lot of new infrastructure being built. So the study we did was, in a way, we call it the 2050 city, and it is actually an evolution, in a way, of the 2020 2050 mm-hmm. tower, be- right. which was already, in a sense, a city, a vertical city. Um, and and really, the question we were asking here was: w- Is it possible to build a truly self-sustaining city by all the criteria we talked about? Mm-hmm. Energy, mm-hmm. water, waste, mm-hmm. food. Uh, and transportation and so on. And if so, what does it look like? Uh, is it in the end, because you can imagine that, okay, take New York today, and if you want to make it totally 100% renewable energy, if we could just have eminent domain <laughs> over the northern half of New Jersey and replace everything there with solar panels, well, sure, of course, you could <laughs> make New York, uh, you know, 100 per- sorry, yeah. maybe we'll do it to Long Island instead. <laughs> but, Staten um, Island, I want Staten Island, come on. <laughs> yeah. So um, it can be done, but, you know, that's, that's not a city. That's, okay, New York and then a giant solar farm outside that is... They've done it already with the water supply. I mean, they've, they've actually commandeered a large portion of the Catskill Mountains drainage system and taken that water and moved it down into New York City. The, you know, that's a Roman aqueduct uh, modernized, basically. And in fact, it's not so much different than the old ones. So New York City is, is famous for doing this, right? And it's a beautiful, wonderful system. It works really good. But... And we're lucky in New York that it's possible to do that. Yeah, you know, exactly. Most of these new, the new population in the world that's coming on is coming in places where people shouldn't be living that's in the true. first place. That's very true. You know, um, mm-hmm. arid parts of the world, the Mideast, Asia, and so on. So what we did for this 2050 City study is say, okay, if we really take the best of all the technologies that are available today, and we make the city as efficient as possible, and so on and so forth, what do we end up with? But we were trying to be very rigorous about it. So we were going to pay for the embodied energy of building and maintaining the city. We were going to pay for the energy in all the travel that the residents of the city do, both locally and mm-hmm. internationally and so on. And in terms of water, we were going to, since uh, 
to simplify things, we cannot assume that there is fresh water at all mm -hmm. available anywhere, mm -hmm. that we're going to desalinate all the water that is used in the city using renewable energy, and uh, that we're going to grow all the food for that city within the city's mm. boundaries. So long story short, we looked at a lot of different options, and the food issue, and this brings us back to vertical farming, turns out to be, along with energy, the biggest footprint by far. So today, basically, a city like New York, the sort of infrastructure that feeds it in food and energy is going to be about 50 times or bigger the area <laughs> of the city, right? But by 2050, with doing everything we could to optimize these mm -hmm. things, it's, um, it's going to be only, all of that infrastructure is only going to be two to three times the wow. size of the city. And what you end up with then is potentially if you mix all that stuff together, the greenhouses, whether they're greenhouses or underground or in mm -hmm. buildings mm -hmm. with the photovoltaic generation on buildings plus a little extra, which you're going to need, um, you, you end up with something that is, uh, if you start out with the density of, say, not quite the density of Manhattan, but the sort of average density of New York or the density of Brooklyn, about, say, 15,000 people per square kilometer, you add to that all that infrastructure, you end up with something that is sort of like the density of Los Angeles today. So it, again, a long, complicated study with a lot of different issues, but it does tell us, I think, that technically you actually can make, in the future when we have these technologies, a city that is totally mm -hmm. self-sustaining, zero carbon energy, water, food footprint, that is still a city. Now, not to say that you should do that, or we will do that, but we think we can do that. But you can't convert an existing city. You can only move, move forward, and when you make a new building, you have to build it to your specifications. Yeah, a much right? more complicated yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of, I mean, you could start with the concept of water recovery, for instance, and that yeah. you don't have yeah, to sure. redo too much in order to get your water back. So a lot of cities are already getting their water back, especially on the West Coast, mm. where they don't have a lot of water to begin with. But they're getting a lot this year. Greg, can you tell us how we can access this information? Because I see a, I'm holding the publication. Is this online so yeah, that let's, people can get we this? Can, we can, you can post all of this. This is a journal site. article, right? Yeah. yeah. This is, uh, I see El Sevier here, which means it might be closed. Pro Procedia Engineering. Let's see if I can get it. <laughs> uh, these, yeah, this would be great to put a link to it anyway, yeah, sure. so people could look. Oh, at we can, it. we can, we can show you that and other information about the 2020, 2050 yeah. Yeah. Uh, tower project, yeah. Yeah. And the great school greenhouses. And, Absolutely, because I mean, this is. I think the listeners have gotten a, a flavor for what modern architecture should be rather than uh, edifice complex uh, building. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know, the Frank Gehry uh, crushed mm -hmm. canned school of architecture, et cetera. I mean, I think that, that architecture has a purpose, and that is to invent the future. And the future has to be acceptable to everybody, not just a few elite people that can afford a million-dollar apartment. And that, it was, that doesn't get you one room in New York right now. Um, and you know what the prices of real estate are now. It's just crazy. Um, architecture has to be the um, engine which um, makes the future acceptable for virtually everybody who lives in the built environment. And you can't exclude anybody from that picture. And as, as a result... Where do you start this idea? I mean, of course, you're an, a mature, um, profitable, I won't say how much, but of course, <laughs> he's smiling when I say this. You're an architecture firm that's already had loads of experience at design and, and execution. Uh, architecture schools, are they actually putting this kind of thinking process into the new architect that graduates, let's say, over the next five to ten years? Yes, I think they are. Com compared to uh, how it was when I was in school and, and really a lot of the intervening years, there, there's just so much of a um, – the, the, the scale and nature and importance of the problem has become clear. And, you know, architects yeah. in the end are – we are – problem solvers well we are artists as well but you know we hopefully we're we're both of those things at the same time and um this the scale of this problem is you know the the younger you are i think the more evident it is and the more important it is so yeah it's it's a very different world in architecture school well, that's these encouraging. Days. this is open access so everybody can excellent. see it excellent well that's very terrific good. and that's got illustrations and that sort of thing in there yeah. too so that's and this wonderful. Uh, but, but none of the 20 
20 building is online anywhere, right? Well, that is. I can give you that. I mean, that you can, there's a PDF, uh, about a six page PDF your, that you can download website? from our website. Okay, and good. so we can give you the link or the actual thing and you can download it. We can, we can include an, a nice animation of the 2020 tower yeah. <laughs> spinning around it and stuff. So, right. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you one last thing. This new Freedom Tower that went up at Ground Zero, is it safer than the other buildings? <laughs> oh, well, sure, it is safer than it was. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's this, um, I mean, I, I'm, as I said, I am very disappointed by the lack of, mm. of creative, fresh thinking to the problems raised by 9-11. Uh, you know, it's... The the free the not one world trade center is a clearly very much an improved version of what mm. was there, but it's you know it's incremental progress. It's kind of the the way that unfortunately most even say green sustainable people work. Like they take what we have today and let's make it a little better. You know, which mm. is another right. way of saying a little less bad. That's right. Rather than trying to figure out, well, what is the best we actually could possibly do, and let's get as close to that as we can. Yeah. I was at a meeting uh, not too long ago in um, Park City. Uh, it was the Design Futures Council. And these are um, hand-picked architects. They're pretty high-end people for the most part uh, with big practices in places like Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York. And they've all reacted the same way that you were just suggesting. The lead uh, certification for a green building is no longer a valid uh, approach to to suggesting that's the way we should continue mm. to go mm. because, as they so aptly pointed out at this meeting again and again, was that when you start tracing a material back to its origins and you say, is that a sustainable practice uh, piece of material? Is the aluminum that we've gotten um, sustainable? Mm. Is the, the wood sources, et cetera? All the building materials that go into these uh, buildings uh, at one point they are, but then if you go back just a little bit before that to the actual source of the raw materials, uh, it turns out to be uh, a facade for a cover-up that's got something to do with bad trade agreements and uh, environmental devastation with regards mm -hmm. to, let's say, getting titanium, which is a big building material. Mm -hmm. But if you knew how titanium was mined... It doesn't come from a hole in the ground. It comes yeah, from the entire yeah. earth. It's not a. It's not a, an environmental friendly uh, material, and yet we think of it as one that is. It's to an advantage because it's so lightweight and it's so strong. It's how you get it that really counts. Uh, they wanted to just junk the whole LED, uh, LED system and go to something else, but they didn't know what else because. Mm -hmm. There's no trace back yet for all the materials. And that's what they wanted to do, was set up a, a barcode so that you could go back to the actual source and say, well, I won't use that because I know how they got it. You know, like, for instance, using tropical hardwoods, which are illegally uh, timbered. Uh, a lot of the, um, the, the lumber that goes to China, for instance, from places like Indonesia and places uh, like Sumatra and mm -hmm. Sulawesi, they're all illegally uh, lumbered. And that's really very sad to see that happening. Well, you know, we're at the point where the the scale and the importance of the problem is become becoming clearer to more and more people. And at, because right. of that, we can no longer afford to look at part of the picture. We can't yeah, be selective right. about it. We've got to look at the whole picture. It's all we, connected, isn't it? If, if you want to solve the problem, ah. you have to address the problem. Mm -hmm. You if, have to understand if. what it is. <laughs> and, well, if, I mean, the if is it's not an option for much longer, is it? I hope not, because well, we, yeah, we're, into, not we're, we're into a national election here, and I can tell you right now, there's such a schism between the Republicans and Democrats with regards to even looking out the window and telling what's going on out there that, you know, there's a ostrich head in the sand approach that one of those groups is using to avoid addressing the issues, and the other group is is determined to, to make a, a, a difference but if you haven't got the cooperation of everybody because the science is quite clear then then you're really in a protracted horrible situation well, I'm will, I'm that's willing what we to bet. we that's what I like least about our political system I'm willing to bet that before he is done even <laughs> Donald Trump is going to build Trump Tower 68 with <laughs> a 
solar integrated facade. You think? And, yeah, you, you yeah. Think? Because at some point it will become a no. Because it will become a no brainer. You know what? Even someone with no brain will do it. He yeah. can make money doing it that right. way. I mean, it turns out to be more economic to do it the green way than it does right. the other way. Right. So that's, that's crazy the direction stuff, we're moving. Yeah. All right. So that that leads me to one the last question, and we'll wrap it up. Is that okay with you? Sure, absolutely. So. We have, you have all these ideas. I'm sure there are other people that have similar ideas. How do you get those ideas into the mainstream wow. so they don't build buildings the old way? Do you have a voice? Do people listen to you? <laughs> Boy, that is a toughie. You know, that is a toughie. There's no reason why. I mean, we did this kind of building integrated photovoltaic mm-hmm. project as far back as, you know, 1989 and so on. And it has almost not been done since and as i've said already there's all kinds of mostly bad reasons for that um my personal feeling just because of my personality has been that the way to do it is just to do it by example to do projects and show that it can be done and inspire people but that's not the only route you know there is uh i think people have to really get engaged in policy and publicity and there you know that is not what I my temperament is so much, but um, that there are a lot of people have to put a lot of effort into into those areas to get the word out and you know make sure we stop uh, subsidizing the old way you know mm-hmm. and clear well, the it, way for the new one. You could get Bill Gates say, "Listen, we could build this exactly. for X money. Exactly. We need to do a demonstration in a city, uh, and that's how you, you Vincent, you that are make sense. Absolutely yeah. correct because now that he's focusing on energy, that's all related to everything yeah. else. Yeah. So, when I was at this uh, Design Futures conference, they announced three buildings mm. that had actually won the Living Building Challenge. For the first time, they had buildings that were zero Mm-hmm. carbon footprint, zero energy footprint. They were amazed that it happened so fast because the Living Building Challenge has been around for about, what, 15 years now? No, not that long. Not that long? No, no. No, that, I mean, there, there, is, there is progress, there is hope, and the yeah. Living Building is one example. You know, it's, it's a much more uh, aggressive and ambitious version of LEED or other green building rating right. systems. But even there, you know, uh, even the Living Building Challenge, really all that it is aiming for in energy, let's say, is to cover the operating energy that, you know, whereas my contention is if you <laughs> look at sort of the full footprint of a building, and you could argue whether the building has to pay for all this, but in, certainly the embodied energy of building it, but then the transportation uh, cost of people going to and from it, sure. you've tripled the energy yeah, that's budget. Right. That's so, right. you know, yeah. we're we're there we are moving in the right direction so then there's this other group called the vertical city which i i would like to mention also because we've both had a say in something like that they've interviewed all of us uh, that that have been involved Mm -hmm. in this kind of information and and they're about to to go forward to build a city that's over a mile high it's an integrated community of buildings basically mile high mile high you can go to their website why do you want to do that well, to save on <laughs> footprint. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. Is it going to wobble? No, 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 no. It's all connected. There are a bunch of buildings in this uh, mile high collection okay. of buildings. Not, uh, yeah, not if you do it right. You know, I can't resist just sort of getting back to <laughs> one of the first images that uh, that came from my first conversation with Dixon mm-hmm. r- nearby here. And that is that, and I know this is not what he is advocating per se but if you could move all of agriculture from the current outdoor Mm -hmm. sector into vertical farms and just let agricultural land just leave it and let it revert to nature wouldn't that be the best carbon sink we have wouldn't it do amazing things for Mm -hmm. uh, habitat and nature and so on and so forth so there is this image which i have in the uh 2050 city paper actually like and i'm not suggesting that that is the right thing to do or that anybody will do it but it is an extreme (laughs) vision if you put all of humanity into cities with their agriculture and everything else and just let the rest of nature (laughs) revert what a you know what a kind of staggering image that is and wouldn't that be the solution to all kinds of problems probably creating a few new ones but it's a really (laughs) and the the vertical city people have a very similar illustration yeah they do they're they're sort of giant mile high vertical city sitting in green pastures right so So it's part of your vision too the ipc yeah the ipc 
the IPCC, which just met in Paris, mm. finished off with a recommendation that no one actually understood when they heard it. And then as you think about it, of course, it makes great sense. They said, uh, instead of corn farmers, we should encourage carbon farmers. Hmm. And what does that mean? And everybody, what's a carbon farmer? It's a, it's a person who allows the trees to grow back yeah, yeah, right. where they used to be. And so that's a wonderful image of renewal. Uh, I love this book called The Man Who Planted Trees for that very reason. Mm -hmm. And so on those notes. Uh, the Man Who Planted Trees. That's a great book. It's an absolutely great book to show you what's possible with a very little effort. Oh, look at that. And there Extreme it is. Dream vision, I mean, self-sufficient city surrounded sure, by a wilderness. Sure. Yeah. If you take the other image of Frank Lloyd Wright, although he was often wrong, <laughs> but he was right about this one. If you go to Pennsylvania and look at his falling water, it's completely surrounded by nature. And sometimes it does bite you in the wrong place because they had a big yeah. flood out there about 1967 that almost washed that house away. But that's the chance you take when you integrate with nature. And um, it's worth the, the chance because people need to feel that they're part of nature. And that, that's where that all comes from. We See, came now. Now we have the lead-in for your next virology <laughs> podcast. That's you know, well, that's right. The unintended consequences. Here are some more bringing nature back in. To, well, this uh, is true. Well, that's life, a, you know. It's a, a modern version of Thoreau that said, you know, in order to think clearly, you have to clear your mind, and in order to do that, you have to return to nature. This um, city in the wilderness. So the problem now is that all they support. For the city is in the suburbs, right? Mm -hmm. And the people who li who work in the city live in the suburbs. Yeah, so it spreads right. out, out, and yeah, out. But that, if you could put right. it all here, yeah. if it's self-sustainable and right. everyone can live here, yeah. it could happen. Right? Sure. Would sure. be very interesting. Good. Well, on that note, <laughs> we should wrap up. This has been a cool episode, really. And you can find it at iTunes and also at microbe.tv slash urban ag. And we love getting your questions and comments. They have dried up because we don't do any episodes. Yeah, well, we'll, but we'll maybe fix this one will stimulate that. some. Oh, I hope it will. Urban Ag at microbe.tv. And our guest today, Gregory Kiss from Kiss and Cathcart Architects. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It was fun. Great, great conversation. I can almost split it into two episodes, you know. You know, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> we could reach an arc. In the middle, we could and say that. the rest next time. That's right. <laughs> Have people coming back. Dixon de Pommier is at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. A lot of fun. I'm just waiting for our next one. And I'm Vincent Dracaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on urban agriculture is performed by John Harrison with the Wichita State University Chamber Players and also. Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to Urban Agriculture. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Hey, Dixon. Yeah, Vince. See you upstairs. Uh, at the vertical farm. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe downstairs. Maybe downstairs. Downstairs.